Hello, everyone. Hello, Aki. Hello, Jeannie. Hey. I hate when that happens. You go out to raise three million, and you accidentally raise oh. almost 300 million. I hate when that happens. It's so hard. Uh, but you guys have had an amazing journey already, even this early on. And yeah. the rest of the journey is going to be equally exciting. So I'm, I'm excited to talk about that journey uh, together with you. Uh, maybe just in terms of introductions, uh, because you're two sisters. Yeah, uh, we tend to talk over each other too, so we're going to be really careful. Yeah. We're going to slow it down so we, our voices oh. sound similar enough that it would be confusing. Exactly, but just, just say uh, which one you are of the two sisters and what you do at the company for starters, and then we'll dive into the, the good bits. Cool, so I'm Jeannie, and I run all like the revenue and sales for both, well, Karma Cans I started at, and now Karma Kitchen. I'm Eki, um, I'm the CEO, and I run finance and strategy and some operations and development for Karma Kitchen and Karma Cans. Yeah. Great. Uh, Jeannie, you already mentioned the name Karma Cans, so that brings us sort of to the start of this journey. <laughs> and we'll start at the beginning as we, as we have to. Uh, where did this all start for you, this journey? What is Karma Cans yeah. in the first place? So Karma Cans is a corporate catering business, and we started it when I was 21 and Eki was 23, back eight years ago now. Um, it now does a thousand meals a day for different tech companies across London. But at the beginning, one of our biggest challenges was finding kitchen space. We moved three times in one year. We took a restaurant kitchen. We then moved into a shipping container that we kitted out ourselves, with basically zero capital. And then we finally took a warehouse in Hackney and we realized we had to sign a five-year lease and it was super expensive. So we ended up subletting it to other people in food. And we just couldn't believe that like, there was nothing in tech if you need a space, you can walk into a co-working space and you've got everything sorted, but in food, you have to build your own, and it's very capital intensive. So after growing Karma Cans to an amazing team it is today, Eki and I came up with the idea for Karma Kitchen as the solution to what we needed at the time. And that's where Karma Kitchen happened. Yeah, and we'll get into a lot more details. Uh, but Eki, you're trained as a chef. Uh, was it your dream to work in the corporate catering business? I. Well, in, I think I may have fallen into it, but I, I basically loved working in the kitchen. I loved the experience of um, being on my feet every day, doing something really practical. I also delivered all of the food from Karma Kitchen as well by bike. I thought it was, I thought I had the best job in the world. I was like building out our kit, first kitchen space, cycling around lunches, cooking, and then when yeah. we, when it came to Karma Kitchen, I just realised that. We both realized that if we didn't do this, somebody else would, and we should really be the people to provide kitchen space, the kind of kitchen space that we needed from our perspective to all of these other businesses. And, and that's really like the central thesis of Common Kitchen. Can we provide space for like thousands and thousands of businesses? And what else can we do within that space? How can we build a good ecosystem for these businesses to grow in? Um, I don't want to move under the assumption that everybody in the audience knows about dark kitchens or okay. virtual kitchens or ghost kitchens, uh, whatever you want to call it. So maybe can you uh, briefly explain the concept behind it? What is a ghost kitchen? I take it. Yeah, take it. Okay, so basically we take big... Um, big warehouses around the edges of um, towns. So I would say in the donut ring around a city, kind of not the very city center, not the very outskirts, but where there's good connections, there's a mixture of um, residential and buildings and also office and commercial um, interests. And we take a big warehouse about 20,000 square foot. So I think that's, is that 200 square meters? Something like that. Do the conversions on stage. Do the conversions on stage, yeah. Stay away from that. Um, and we, take, we fit out kitchen units in it of all different sizes. And what's unique about Karma Kitchen is that we serve the whole food market from really small startups in, on shared work benches where you can literally rent a bench for one hour a week if you need to, all the way through to massive companies like Unilever. Um, and we provide space at all different levels on all different terms and we put them all together in these big um, big fitted spaces and let them just like do their thing and we don't touch the food but we do look after lots of the low level operations the cleaning the maintenance all of that stuff and our job is to build infrastructure both physical and technical infrastructure for these businesses to help them run smoothly Exactly. You build and provide infrastructure. You're selling the shovels to all the ghost kitchen startups that are getting a lot of uh, recognition. Uh, you're doing it very well. Um, but of course, you still have your corporate catering business, which is so, so amazing that you kept Karma Cans going as well. Like, well, what's the reasoning behind that? Karma Cans are baby, and 
We just think that it's a, it's we've had a tough year with COVID. You know, we had we're doing our best year, and then we went to zero revenue in a week. And it's just such a resilient business. We got a contract with the NHS, which carried us through. We're doing a thousand meals a day with different hospitals. And although Eki and I aren't really that involved in the day to day, we've built such an amazing team around us. I mean, the team at Karma Cans have been with us for six years. They've watched us. At the beginning of our journey, I was 21. I didn't know how to manage a team. I was running sales and I had no sales background. And they, they stuck it. They stuck it out it with our, us. It was our training ground, team-wise, yeah. culture-wise. And um, when you look at it, when you build a revenue-driven business um, from the ground up, and it's you, know, you really have to make those hard choices, the people that join you for that kind of journey, which is like a brutal journey, ups and downs. We've <laughs> talked a lot about internally about how that can look. When you get through to that, at the end, you know, you have some people around you and you have some things there that you just can't make that happen in a second, no matter how much cash you have. It, it takes time to build that. I mean, we literally, you're right, our, reven our revenue for Karma Cans was wiped out. And when we used to sit in our sales meetings at, before the pandemic at Karma Cans, and we'd be like, everybody would be just be like giving each other a pat on the back and a round of applause every month. We're like, we grew 30% this month. And the catering is so competitive. So Yeah, this competitive market. And then when the pandemic hit, we were like, oh no, like we're not growing at 30% every month anymore and to be credit to our team they literally pulled everything together with with our help and when you've brought your business or two businesses through a pandemic and granted karma kitchen you know that that's a good in, in market for it in, the, in, in covid but i i can't let that go you know that's just a, it's a foundation of who we are as people and what it's meant for us to like build that right from nothing and it's also priceless education because you can feel the pain points of your customers firsthand, uh, so you know what they go through, of course. So I, I understand why you keep it going, for sure. Um, so let's talk about that journey, and actually the, the topic of this session was your, your fundraise last year, which was coming from a journalist in the European tech space, one of these stories that you were like, this would have never happened uh, you know, even three, four years ago, but now apparently that can happen. So can you walk us through what actually happened when you are to, to raise your Series A round? Yeah. yeah. Should I start? Yeah. So we are not quick to raise money. And um, it takes, it's taken, each round has taken us a lot of time to do, at least a year. And even our seed round, which was very small. Um, and we were just hitting our heads against the same wall for, for almost a year, nine months. We were trying to raise capital from VCs to buy buildings and put, put fit out, you know, basically spend, we'd buy a building for four million pounds and we'd fit it out for two and a half million pounds. And we were knocking on VC stores and going, why won't you give us money for that? And they were like, yeah, we're kind of more interested. Are you a tech company? Is there any tech element to it? Like this like, tech? Yeah, this some tech. tech. You know, on, on top, we build the technical infrastructure too, but before you build the technical infrastructure, you need the physical infrastructure. That's where all of our clients are centered. So after a long time and Probably a lot of rejection. How much rejection do you think? A lot of, yeah, this is a great idea, but it's just not for us. I, I, maybe it, more than 70 of those, basically. We, we, we got like pinged by a big PE company in like the November, and they were like, hey, like, have you thought about a prop co op co structure? We're a private equity company. Have you heard of private equity? And we're like, no, we haven't heard of private equity. No, we haven't heard of a prop co op co structure. We did a ton of reading and research about it, and we just realized that, oh, we ha we're an asset heavy business, and m the vast majority of our costs go into our assets, and then they start making money for us when we turn an operating profit on those units within, you know, three to six months of them opening. So, completely different return profile to what a VC is looking for. It fit really well into more real estate focused funds. And um, within two months, we had another three offers on the table for this prop co-structure. And yeah, we, we were close. We, we, there was a bump in the road in, at the beginning of the pandemic when we had a, a deal fall apart. Um, but we picked it back up and again, like had a couple more offers and, um, and the deal closed up by, you know, just a few months after we had discovered this mid lockdown way of doing things. And it just shows you like, you can spend all of your time just focused on the wrong thing because you don't know what's out there. And I think as, because we not from startup background and with, you know, Karma Cancer is quite, a, you know, it's a revenue driven business. You don't know 
where, like how money, the structure of money and the structure of the startup world works. But I, I love that you bring this up because th that was going to be my next point because you don't come from the startup world. You didn't even know what venture capital and private equity was in, in say when you started raising. I find that so amazing because you're two young women coming from like a, a corporate catering business entering this world. But you also feel like a few years ago that that wouldn't have happened. Like I don't know how you, how much you know about like private equity and venture capital world right now, but there is a lot of money flowing in, and it needs to be invested somewhere. So, do you think you could have pulled this off even three, four years ago? No, I don't think we could have. I mean, really, every single year we're learning so much more about fundraising and different types of money. You know, when we started Karma Cans, we got invited to a VC's office, and we turned up with some lunches. We didn't really know. We knew that they were going to invest in us, but we didn't really know what we wanted. But I was 21. They said they wanted us good. to come in for a chat, so we went in. Yeah, we for a chat. came in with these lunches, and we're like, "Yeah, let's have lunch." And then they asked us how much money we wanted. You said ten thousand pounds. Like, yeah, they were expecting a pitch, and you Ten, showed up with lunch and yeah, they were lunches. expecting a deck. I don't know if we knew what a deck was. And then we pulled out our lunches, and we just told them about the business, and they said, "So, how much do you want?" And we looked at each other, we're like, yeah, maybe 10K, 10,000 pounds. They're like, that's what the legal fees will cost for this deal. And we're like, oh, we think we're okay then. No, but this has been really great to meet you. Great, this will be great. And then, so, you know, a few years later, Thanks for the come food. Back. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the food. Enjoy the food, it's on us. You really wasted that food. You know, just like, I think they just see it. things in a different way as you get older. But I also think that where, you know, people talk a lot about dark kitchens and the name Dark Kitchens. And when we started, no one knew, kind of, it was, we had to explain to a lot of people what we, what we were doing and what we were building. And as the market timing is important, maybe three years ago, we wouldn't have been able to kind of do the deals that we're looking at now because the market didn't understand the asset class that we are building. And, and I do think that dark kitchens are a new asset class of real estate that, um, that it's the most uh, important thing is like developing the that that piece as alongside all of the stuff that we do in the operating business and all of the interesting tech that we're building and the clients that we're serving the actual real estate itself is a, it's a new thing you know and it's a it's an emerging new market that is a new category so the more that people understand what that is the easier the ride is for, yeah. for you so let's dive a bit deeper into your, your business then, because you built infrastructure for kitchens, but that's not all you do and that's not all you have planned. Um, so maybe let's talk about where you are today, yeah. and then we'll move sort of to, to future plans. But you're in the business of essentially buying properties and turning them into something that didn't exist you know, even a few years ago. Um, how does the, the real estate, the property market in, in the UK, where you operate now, uh, respond to something like that? Do you find that they're very open uh, to those conversations, or was it difficult to get in? Jeannie, how, how, are, the, how are the landlords? I think that um, it's, with dark kitchens, they've had a lot of bad press. So when we find a new location, we are aware that some of the councils, at, if you say you're a dark kitchen, are... Don't get excited by it, but Karma Kitchen does things very differently because we're for startups and we're also for those large restaurants and chains. We go after, as we said, the whole food sector. We run a lot of programs like youth training and we run a food fellowship where we give free kitchen space for a year to different food brands. So we kind of want to be celebrated when we enter an area. You know, we have a lot of people coming down to our sites and actually purchasing food from our kitchens. So they're not your classic dark kitchens. So we've actually been really, really lucky. The council have been very on board with our spaces so far. In terms of the design of the space and who our brand appeals to, we are super focused on the idea that unless you build trust with the end eater, the end consumer, you know, people want to know where their food is made. They want to know what goes into it, who made it, if the chefs are being paid well. They want to know what kind of environment that the chefs are working in. And if you come to us, like our site, our, one of our um, kitchen sites, what you'll see is like natural light, like full of glass, pink tiles, colorful like images, loads of people with like their music on full, you know? It's a real home for those It's a real businesses. hub, yeah. And that, we want to tell that story to the consumers in the area around our spaces so that when we enter a new market, 
you know, people are like, oh, yes, the Karma Kitchen's open. We got, can't wait for all this cool food to come out of it and, like, these new products and it's so interesting and come down and, like, do a cookery course, do a youth training program yeah. with us. And our, very and, and our customer group, so obviously we've spoken about how we have the startups. They act as an amazing funnel for the rest of the space. So 70% of those businesses start in our kitchen. And, of course, a space like that has high churn and those businesses are quite vulnerable at times, especially in a pandemic. But we've seen so many of them grow with us. You know, we got day one of their business and now they're in three of our sites, which is such a cool story. And what we want to do is take them to you know, 30 sites. And we have the power to do that, which is amazing. What about expansion? Uh, do you want to stick to the UK or do you want to expand geographically over time? We definitely want to expand it to Europe. Like that's priority number one. It's going to take us a, a few months, I think, from the point that we're at now to get there. We've got a, a few months. Okay, if you, if you <laughs> went optimistic. Yeah. Well, maybe 12 months, but yeah. I think um, we are. We're basically. We've we've got a lot of sites under construction right now at the moment in the UK. So got to get those open and running really smoothly. And then when they are, um, Europe is 100% on their agenda. There's so many amazing markets in Europe that we just love to be in, and so many great businesses that. We we think we can really support yeah. and help. Come on, spill the beans. Which markets are you looking at? <laughs> we really want Amsterdam to be kind of the first city that we hit. We think that food production and delivery is incredible there. And you're also very close to uh, Rotterdam where Unilever's headquarters are. So the idea is to help businesses grow and be hopefully bought by some of those bigger corporations. We like Paris and Berlin as well. Um, anywhere, you know, where we would where we would like to probably spend. No, I'm joking. Anywhere that I want to spend a bit of time. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Great weather is, is, is also great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go, go down south a bit. Um, and what does a city need to have for you to be interested in it in the first place? Or is any city really open, open game? I think the key thing is that it's got a high population density or there are pockets of it which have a high population density. And it really helps us when um, there's an existing food culture, a really good food scene, and some delivery activities going on. When, there are, um, when people are comfortable with the idea of ordering their food on delivery, um, that, that's helpful for us as well, as well as a really vibrant yeah, local food culture. Do you, more things? you guys are a B2B to C company essentially. So you sell to essentially restaurants, kitchens, and other other uh, people in the food supply chain. I would say, um, how do the conversations go usually? How do you bring them in? Um, do they need a lot of convincing? Uh, what are the you do lots of the sales? So yeah. I guess I'll turn to you. But how do this conversation usually go? To be honest, it's a quite easy sell because you're providing a solution. And when we first open our first site, nothing like that exists. So we were basically doing all of the capex for all of these food businesses. You're giving them a space where all they have to do is think about the food. And in our share kitchen, we're doing everything, even chopping boards, you know, pots and pans. So it's a real no-brainer if you want to grow your business. Also, more traditionally, if you're a restaurant, to get a restaurant, it can take up to, you know, a million pounds and you have to sign like a five to ten year lease. So And take you eight months. And take you it. eight months. What we're saying is it's half, it's less than half that money. We'll provide the space. It's a year lease for the six month break up course. Um, but also share kitchens monthly rolling. So if you want something even more flexible, we've got that. So it really is, at first, it was a tricky sell because nothing existed like that. You know, co-working exists, but not in food. And people were like, why would I want to share my space? But when you present it as, it will save you money, it will help you scale, and it's flexible. So if you don't like it, you can leave. And suddenly people start to listen. And now we've got, you know, we've had a, a bit of press with our space. It's a beautiful space, so it sells itself. Like, it's all glass. It's so, it's really cool. The sell now is, is an easy one. It's like, we're lowering the barriers to entry to your business so enormously that it's, it just is a no-brainer to give it a go. And you walk into the space, most people who walk into our spaces are like, wow, like, this is, this is so cool. It's all like, you know, they meet the other businesses and people are having a good time. But I think also what we're starting to understand is that for many of our businesses, there's like missing pieces for food businesses that they, they struggle to understand their margin. That's a key piece. Mm. And also when it comes to the ancillary services and how much they're spending on um, all of their combined um, bills every month, our goal over the next few years, well, I guess we have like two goals, one on the physical infrastructure and one on the digital side of it. Yep. The physical infrastructure is obviously to grow to like 30, 40 sites, make all of our sites net zero, and by proxy make all of the businesses that operate within our sites net zero as well. And the digital infrastructure side is like, how can we make 
everybody, so one of our operations team, Molly, coined, coined this slogan, which has like been core to our business, which is a busy business is a happy business. And when our businesses do well, that's when they feel good and they're the happiest. So how can we make our businesses do well in every space that we go into? And in order to do that, you need to have a great understanding of the data around the location that you're going into, the density, the area itself. And you need to understand your business's margins and what's feeding into that. So how much are they spending on their stock? Can we get them onto our preferred partner networks? Um, how much are they wasting? How much food waste do they create? Can we reduce that? When do their team arrive and leave the site every day? Like, are they efficiently using their, their team's time to give them and bringing all of that information into just one clear data point that a business manager, no matter what site they're in or if they never visit the site, can easily just understand business performance in every common kitchen location that a business is in. That's like the next step for us for the next year alongside all the site building. Oh, this just popped into my head. This didn't come up, uh, come to me in the prep, but what you just said, that you, you essentially you built all this knowledge and data points about businesses. That's something you could sell as a service, almost as a consulting business on site. Is that also in the plans? Because it sounds like a logical step to take. We just want our businesses more than anything to do well. It benefits our our physical space cell, but it's a service that we, we add a lot of service level on top of the space and some of it we bill for, but it's about whatever they're getting billed for, whether it's extra storage or laundry or insurance or using this preferred partner network or understanding their margin, that it's all in one place and from start to finish, you just have one, you know, Sally's Cakes or Jeannie's What, what kind of product would you make? Kombucha. Jeannie's kombucha. You know, she joins, I, I call Jeannie's kombucha, and she, like the first, from the first call we have to her like leaving the space and going into her co-packing, I'm, I'm imagining a whole life for you now. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really, really this. It's, going, it's going well for you. You've, you've expanded to co-packing and you're, you've been offboarded from our space now. Um, the whole journey. Um, that you're just one data point moving through the space and I can track, um, you can track your margin and I'm helping you do it, um, you know, for, but on every different aspect and we can, because we build the physical infrastructure, you can, you can have a ton of IoT, like showing how much water usage you're using and how much electricity you're using and how heavy your bins are every day, everything through to this is how much your product is costing you to make, so that's a good I don't know if the audience picked up on this, but Jeannie's mentioned something interesting, is that you also have the transparent separator, so everything is glass, so the restaurant business can also see each other, and like, yeah. which is very counter to what people think a dark kitchen is, I think. It's a very like closed space, cubicles, you don't really see what everyone else is doing. Is that an intentional decision on your part? So important. When we used to work in kitchens, you'd do like the graveyard shift, and you'd be on your own, you know, at three in the morning, and it's a really depressing place to, to be. What we wanted is at any point in the day, even if you're just one chef working for one business, you can always see someone else. And natural collaboration happens from that. You know, we have restaurants watching cake makers in the share kitchen who then collaborate and stock their cakes. And that's without us actually doing anything, but it just creates more of a community. It's so important to be able to see other people work. So the reason you raised uh, as much money as you did last year yeah. was because you need to buy properties. So just to be clear, you don't lease, you buy properties, which means you had to very quickly educate yourself on, on real estate market and buying buildings and whatnot. So what are some of the things that you've learned in a nutshell that you can share with the audience? I think that about buying property, I think anyone can learn anything. It's, it, you know, real estate, I'm not going to say real estate is like a simple industry. There's a lot of complexity there and you a lot to understand. But if you are, if you need to, you as an individual and you as a team can learn and bring on anybody that you need to, to, to grow as a person and also as a, as a, as a culture. Yeah. And uh, definitely like a relationship business. You build a network of different, you know, agents and landlords that you work with who think of you when they have a certain site and they come to you first. So it's been a real learning curve. Um, I spend a lot of my time in like a hard hat and high vis, very glamorous life. It's gone from a hairnet in the kitchen and gloves to a hard hat and high vis. So schmoozing a, like some strange person in, on an on a industrial state in the yeah. middle of nowhere. When, when we like, to turn up to industrial states, people were a bit confused, but it's getting better. But I guess the benefit is also once you've learned, it doesn't differ all that much from other markets in Europe. Once you get there, then it's just sort of you know, fair game. That's exactly it. I think that you know, there are food businesses all over Europe. 
there are food businesses who do all of the same things that food businesses in the UK do. We, make, we serve people that make wedding cakes. We serve people that do corporate catering and people that do delivery. And each market has its own unique kind of profile of different businesses. And the real estate that we buy into also exists in every major city all across Europe. So I do feel like this is a business that can scale and, and definitely will. And especially if you're providing a very good quality of like background operation like tech to, to support billing and to support all it make your systems very robust, um, then you know, then you're in a good position to like move move across Europe. In each of our spaces, there are around 60 businesses. Yeah. So think about them all doing very <laughs> different things. And depending on what time you go down to site, it's a completely different space. Like the morning is all production. So anyone doing cakes, granola, catering. The afternoon is delivery, like crazy for drivers. And overnight, it's often bakers. So it's a 24-hour space with so many different types yeah. of profiles. And what type of food business don't you have yet that you think you will in the future that Ooh. you want to address? Ooh, the food science is something that we've started having more and more food science businesses come. So we had a company called Jelly Drops who make hydration eats for people with dementia. And so cool, great product. They started in our first site. So many good product. We love seeing a good product. We get it's great. We get people so early in their journey before they go out and like outsource production. But um, that's a big part of our expansion plan. So to build kitchens for delivery, for production, but also food science. And um, we're also looking into vertical farming too. We've talked to a lot of people in the last few weeks, um, and even at Slushwood, doing such interesting things with like meat culture and like cheese culture and, and downstream processing of all of these new innovative products. And we'd love to be able to provide that more like life science, the cro kind of crossover between life sciences space and like food space, food production space for those kind of businesses thinking about the future of food. I think that if you're building space that is like net zero in the next like couple of years and you've got all of these interesting services and products, like that should be a home, a hub as well for all of the future pieces of the food market. Yeah. And you're also in a position where you're forced to look at the trends in mobility for the delivery part of things. Um, what are some of the trends that you can see on that level that will change or, or dictate the way you run your business in the future? Mm. So one thing that we are providing in all of our future sites um, is EV charging points. And um, the reason for that is we want all of our kitchens to be serviced by electric vehicles. Um, and luckily, we're, we're partnering up with, um, with a big uh, fossil, fuel, fossil fuel company, but they're now moving only to renewables. So all of our substations and electricity connections will be powered by renewables only. Um, and that means that um, not only, you know, we, what we want to create is like basically areas for drivers to charge their vehicles and also local residents to see our, um, our kitchens as a place where they can stop and also charge up their, their vehicles very, very close to their house. Um, mm -hmm. And we're definitely seeing a trend across the board in delivery companies to move to electric and to provide um, their own fleets as well, which yeah. we yeah. are all for because all that for. helps us build good relationships with the communities around us. The other trend we're seeing is virtual brands. I don't know how much you know about that, but it's brands that don't have bricks and mortar. They're purely virtual. They take a kitchen space and they run 10 to 15 concepts, um, all different branding. And that has been just growing so much over the last kind of year since COVID. It's definitely a hard one to make work because you have to do so much work on the marketing if you don't have a restaurant. But the ones that do well are doing really, really well. Mm -mm. Great. Uh, do you see yourself um, being acquisitive in the future, maybe buying similar businesses to yours? If there are any out there, actually, I don't know. I think we would love to, definitely, um, that are aligned in the way that we build. We build in a very different way to our competition. You know, we are focused on the whole food sector. Delivery is a massive part of our business. I would say it's 50% is what we're aiming for it to be. But we definitely are keeping our eyes open. Yeah. Uh, we're about to get to the end of the session. We have about a minute and a half. So, quickly. Um, so maybe for the aspiring entrepreneurs in the room, um, what you've learned so far, what kind of advice would you give to people who also want to raise 300 million uh, euros instead of 3.5? So I would say um, to not be afraid of your competition. When we started Karma Cans and Catering, I was always terrified when another business came along and was doing the same thing. 
when you have competition, what it does is it changes the mindset of the individual. So with lunch delivery, when Deliveroo came around, before Deliveroo, we were trying to pitch people on getting their food delivered to their desk. That sounds crazy now because everyone loves delivery. But at the time, people were like, why would I want my food delivered? Then Deliveroo just changed the way that people worked and then it was such an easy sell. The same with Karma Kitchen. The more people opening space like this helps us become an asset class and helps people think, I'm not going to build a kitchen, I'm going to go to a space that exists. So never kind of look at competition as a negative. It can really help your business would be mine. Um, know what kind of money you need and what kind of returns your business is going to generate. <laughs> like if, um, if you're generating like SaaS, if you're like a SaaS business and you're delivering a kind of you potential to deliver a 20x return in a year, I mean, amazing, definitely VC is for you. But if you're doing something a little bit more agnostic where just know what your return profile looks like and then you'll be able to match you know, the right kind of money to your business. And there is a, there is a lot of money out there, as we realized when we started to, to look and look in the right places. Um, but I think also it's just important to know which kind of money is going to suit you the best, basically. Yeah. That's great advice from both of you. Um, that's, that's all the time we had. It flew by. Um, thank you for sharing your insights. I'm going to keep watching your journey. I think it's really interesting. Uh, thank you for joining Slush, and thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Uh, see you later.